Hello, and thank you all for joining us today for the first of our webinar series demonstrating the utility of 3D cell culture with today's presentation on applications in toxicology. Our presenters will cover regulated and non-regulated toxicology, tissue models including epiderm, epiocular, epi-airway, epi-alveolar, and epi-intestinal, and will focus on MATEX development of the inhalation tox and intestinal tox assays. We will have a Q&A session after the presentation, so please feel free to send us your questions throughout. Um, this webinar will be recorded and you'll receive a link to access it after its conclusion. And we'll also be sending out a survey for feedback and to give you a chance to let us know what you'd like to see from MATEC in the future. It's my pleasure to introduce our presenters to you today. Um, first is Katie Dunnick, and Katie has her PhD in Pharmaceutical and Pharmacological Sciences from West Virginia University, where she researched nanoparticle toxicity in pulmonary models. And following her PhD, she spent time researching genotoxicity and developed a unique assay to measure double-stranded breaks. She then specialized in primary cells isolation prior to joining MATEC. And our next presenter is Larissa Walker. And Larissa received her Master of Science in Microbiology from the University of Montana, where she researched the mechanism of action for a novel therapeutic targeting the treatment of antibiotic resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And following her master, she switched her focus to the development of small molecule therapeutics for the treatment of skin keratinization disorders, specifically ichthyosis and Darrier's disease. And I'll now hand it over to Katie to begin the presentation. Great. Thank you, Margo. So before we get into the actual data, I thought it would be helpful to introduce MatTech as a company for those of you that aren't familiar with us. So MatTech was founded in 1985 and began producing human tissue models in the early 1990s as a replacement for animal models. Since then, we have become the leaders in tissue model creation, and we now offer 15 different models with more in R&D. We have also expanded our portfolio to include cells and media, as well as cultureware products, to provide researchers with custom solutions to their complex research projects. In 2021, we were acquired by BICO, the largest bioconvergence company, and we now have the resources of multiple sister companies to solve our customers' challenges. Now I'll discuss the technology of how these tissues are made, and then we'll discuss how the 3D models are used in the field of toxicology. So to create or grow our 3D models, organ tissue is received and the cells are isolated. We then expand those cells to create a large bank of the same donor. By creating this large bank, it allows us to continue using the same donor over years for consistent model production. After this expansion, the cells are cryopreserved and then thawed when we are ready to create the, or grow the tissue. The cells are seeded onto the cell culture inserts and allowed to differentiate and stratify over time in culture. We then provide customers with a fully differentiated human tissue that is ready to use upon arrival. So once you receive this tissue, you can immediately use it after an equilibration period. As I mentioned, MatTech currently offers 15 human tissue models with more currently in development to meet the growing field and assist our customers in replacing animal models with human relevant 3D tissues. We offer, offer models to recapitulate the oral cavity, ocular surfaces, pulmonary organs, skin, including both healthy and disease, as well as intestinal and vaginal organs. And this little um, mat tech figure does a nice job of representing the various areas that these organs come from. These models are created in various size cell culture inserts, depending on the model and specific research endpoints. The surface area of these different models range from 11 millimeters to 42 millimeters, depending on which size you purchase. Our epi airway, epiderm, and epi intestinal models can be grown in 96 well plates to allow for high throughput screening. The 3D models can be shipped globally, either from our site in Massachusetts or our site in Slovakia, and are shipped on a weekly basis for timely delivery. In addition, the 3D models provide many advantages over animal models and 2D cell models. The models are all grown from primary human cells, ensuring high in vivo relevance as demonstrated by the in vivo-like structure and function that's measured. And you'll see that throughout the presentation today. The models are highly reproducible, 
which has allowed for regulatory acceptance for various toxicology endpoints and animal model replacement. The models are easy to use, and because they are all grown at the air liquid interface, topical and basolateral exposure is possible. This further allows for more in vivo relevant exposure methods. And finally, compared to animal studies, these models are also very cost effective. In addition to the regulatory space and acceptance in that field, the 3D models can be used to study a variety of different endpoints. All of these endpoints are services that MatTech currently offers internally, but are also endpoints our customers and partners have used. Commonly, MatTech models are thought of in the toxicology field for looking at viability and inflammatory markers. However, our 3D models can also be used in drug delivery studies to determine compound permeation and can be used to study changes in the physiology of the models following various exposures. Given the air liquid interface platform, numerous exposure methods can be used, such as direct application as well as vapor exposures. And we'll talk about both of those types of applications throughout today's webinar. Additionally, the number of cells within each model allows for gene expression analysis and protein expression studies. For researchers that are interested in studying oxidative stress, the models can be used in various reactive oxygen species endpoints, such as studying NERF2 and genetic toxicology by measuring comet formation or even measuring micronucleus formation. While these two slides highlight methods that have been used on these models, unique testing services and assay development is something that's commonly done with the 3D models offered through MATTECH, which we'll demonstrate today. Now that I've given an overview of the model generation and the endpoints that we commonly test with the 3D models, we'll go into greater detail on specific studies that have utilized MATTECH 3D tissues. For our webinar today, we will focus on the toxicology field, starting with regulatory tox, followed by inhalation tox, and then we'll wrap up with intestinal tox studies. I'd like to mention that the studies we show today really truly only represent a very small subset of the possibilities with 3D models. And we're happy to answer questions at the end for possibilities that we don't discuss today. So as I mentioned multiple times about regulatory testing, the 3D models are heavily utilized in that space, especially for the four listed OECD testing guidelines on this slide. Uh, for those aren't, that aren't familiar, OECD is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which provides researchers with internationally agreed upon chemical testing methods for regulatory safety tests. For a method to receive OECD approval, numerous data points actually have to be met to demonstrate repeatability, reliability, and accuracy. The development and approval of these alternative in vitro methods can actually take greater than 10 years depending on the model. The four methods I have listed on this slide utilize either the epiocular or epiderm MATTECH models. And today, MATTECH is actually the only provider of 3D tissues with acceptance in all of the listed assays with our 3D products. For the first listed assay up here, um, this is for epiocular. It was OECD approved in 2007. It uses a reconstructed human cornea-like epithelium to determine the eye irritation potential. It can be used as a replacement for the DRAES test, which uses rabbits. Epiderm, which was approved for the three test me methods listed below, um, has been OECD approved for skin irritation, which I'll discuss in quite a bit greater detail in the next few slides. It's also been approved as a replacement for the DRAES skin corrosion test, and was finalized for approval in 2004. But most recently, Epiderm received approval in 2021 as an in vitro alternative for phototoxicity assessment. For those of you that aren't familiar, phototoxicity measures the potential for a test chemical to become activated and cause irritation in the presence or absence of simulated sunlight. The continued regulatory acceptance of our models as alternatives or parts of tiered testing strategies demonstrates the high reliability and reproducibility of MATTECH 3D models. For today's webinar, I'll focus on the skin irritation test and describe how the protocol was developed and how the epiderm model is used. 
So I've mentioned epiderm a few times. I think this slide does a nice job of showing you an H&E image of what it look like, looks like. Um, but epiderm, which is known as the reconstructed human epidermis, consists of normal human-derived epidermal keratinocytes that are cultured on tissue culture inserts and then grown at the ear liquid interface. Epiderm allows for the evaluation of topically applied neat compounds, chemicals, cosmetics, and personal care products ingredients, as well as final formulations. While it can be used for anti-aging, genotoxicity, drug delivery, as well as the other tests listed on this slide, today we'll focus on its use in OECD testing guideline 439 skin irritation protocol. So as I mentioned, these um, OECD testing guidelines can take quite a long time to develop, so this does a nice job of showing that development. For the skin irritation protocol, it was developed as an alternative to the Dre skin irritation test that was initially conducted in rabbits. Development as the regulated of the regulated assay actually began in 1999 with the pre-validation studies. After the initial results from that study, further optimization studies were deemed necessary, and between 2001 and 2004, the protocol was redeveloped and finalized. In 2004 to 2007, full validation studies took place and resulted in the acceptance of the epiderm model as part of a tiered testing strategy. However, MATTEC continued to optimize the protocol, and in 2009, it was accepted as a fully validated standalone OECD test method, allowing for replacement of animals. So depending on the test substance, this method can be used as either a complete replacement of the in vivo rabbit test allowing for discrimination between category two irritants and non-irritants. On the next slides, we'll, I'll describe how the actual assay is run. So now that you know how to use the epiderm, or so now, how do you actually use the epiderm model for skin irritation? So based on the optimized protocol that I mentioned, on day zero, the tissues are received and equilibrated overnight. After the equilibration period, the tissues are dosed with compounds for 60 minutes, and then they're thoroughly washed to remove the compounds. Media can then be collected following exposure to measure chemokine or cytokines. However, this isn't part of the OECD requirement for determining irritation, but is a nice extra endpoint that people can measure if they're interested. 42 hours post-exposure on day three, Tissue viability is then measured using an MTT assay. If you're not familiar, this assay uses a colorimetric MTT, which is a tetrazoleum dye, to determine viability. MTT is reduced by viable cells to formicin, which has a purple color. So the relative quantity of the purple color can then be measured, and you can determine the viability compared to the controls. So after quantification, um, of the purple color and the viability is compared to the negative control. In this assay, it's sterile DPVS. If the viability of the epiderm tissue is less than 50% after the 42 hour exposure, this correlates with an, in, an irritant in an in vivo test. If it's above 50%, then it would be a non-irritant in an in vitro test. As I mentioned, the negative control for this is sterile DPVS. DPVS and the positive control that is used in this assay is 5% SDS to ensure that the assay is working correctly. And you can see that in the graph, these are just some representative negative control, positive control, and some test articles showing some variation in the potential results you'd get with your test compounds. So in addition to being useful for the irritation potential of the neat chemicals, as I showed in the past two slides, Continued work has actually also been underway to utilize epiderm for medical device extract irritation potential as well. So for medical device extracts, epiderm was tested in 16 different laboratories using irritant chemicals as well as polymer biomaterials that were extracted in either non-polar sesame oil or polar sodium chloride. And on the next slide, the sodium chloride is actually referred to as saline. As I mentioned, the epiderm model has used the same method for growth and development over the past 30 years, which allows for high inter and intralab comparability. So the graph on this slide actually shows the ability of epiderm to correctly and reproducibly detect positive control irritant compounds in both the sodium chloride 
and the sesame oil. You can see that here in the vehicle control, high inter and intralab comparability, same with the positive control and the extraction material did not alter the consistency. This study also tested medical device extract representative materials. And again, the consistency between the labs and within the studies was high, demonstrating the ability to run these tests at any location and receive the same result. When extracting in the sodium chloride, which is shown on the left, which is the saline, all 16 laboratories correctly predicted the test material irritant potential, and that resulted in a 99.7% accurate um, prediction. When extracting in the sesame oil, however, the predictivity dropped to 94%. As you can actually see in this graph, this was mainly due to the silicone plus heptanoic acid, which had high variability between and within labs. And we didn't see that when it was in the saline um, extraction material. The researchers in this article actually pointed out that this variability is likely due to the extraction material itself and not due to the assay or the reliability. So in 2021, this study actually resulted in the new drafting of ISO 1099323 for in vitro irritation testing of medical devices as a replacement for animal irritation studies. This further demonstrates the utility of these 3D human models to replace and reduce animal tests. So in addition to the regulatory use, MATTECH 3D models can also be used for the evaluation of specific endpoints, such as pulmonary toxicity following the exposure to inhaled compounds. Pulmonary toxicity studies are often conducted with the epiary model that consists of normal human-derived tracheobronchial epithelial cells. It can also be cultured with normal human stromal fibroblasts in our epi airway full thickness model if desired. Epi airway is amendable to acute and long-term chronic studies across numerous in vitro applications and be, can be cultured for greater than one month when following MATTECH protocols and using MATTECH media. This model can be grown with both healthy or diseased donors, and the option of adult and adolescent donors are also available depending on the desired study and the end goals of the researcher. Epi airway is used in drug delivery, inflammation, and viral infection studies as listed here, but it's also heavily utilized in the tobacco and vape study field to research inhalation toxicity. And that's actually what we'll focus on today. So pulmonary toxicity can be evaluated typically through two different exposure methods. One is using aerosol generating machines, such as the Vitrocell VC1, which is what MATTECH uses, or through direct apical or basolateral exposures. Today, we'll discuss results from both type of exposure methods. But for those of you that aren't familiar, we've actually put together a video on how the VC1 Vitrocell system works. And so I'll start that video now, and then we'll get into some data that uses that. Hi, I'm Rob Jackson, a scientist in the contract testing group here at MATSEC. Today we'll be working with our Epi Airway Tissue, an in vitro 3D model of the human bronchial airway, using the Vitrocell VC1 smoking machine to mimic in vivo cigarette smoke exposure and evaluate inhalation toxicology. Working in a biosafety cabinet, we'll add 1.5 milliliters of assay medium into each chamber of the exposure module. Then we'll place an epi airway tissue into each chamber, checking to ensure the tissues are properly seated and in contact with the medium. We'll carefully place the top on the exposure module and clamp it in place in order to seal the chambers and maintain a controlled exposure during the test. We'll move from the biosafety cabinet and head over to the bench top where we'll connect the exposure module to the system. Water from a heated water bath is circulated through the exposure module to maintain the 37 degrees Celsius temperature. Chambers four through six are used as control air exposures and chambers one through three are connected to the smoke dilution system and used for smoke exposure. 
Each chamber is connected to a vacuum system preset to a specific rate to draw smoke or air into the chamber. The vacuum pump is started and we're ready for smoke exposure. We'll place a cigarette into the holder and light it. Smoke will be drawn from the cigarette using a predetermined puff regime. In this case, we're using the Health Canada Intense Regime, which is a 55 milliliter puff every 30 seconds. The machine will draw smoke into this glass cylinder and release it into the dilution system, where it will mix with a preset flow of dilution air. The vacuum system will draw a portion of this diluted smoke into the chamber. Whatever smoke is not deposited onto the apical surface of the airway tissues will be drawn from the chamber through the vacuum. Using this controlled exposure method with our airway tissues mimics a human smoking a cigarette and the exposure of their bronchial airway to the smoke. Once dosing is completed, we'll disconnect the exposure module from the machine's tubing and remove the tissues in a biosafety cabinet. We'll place the tissues into a plate with fresh assay medium and put them back into the incubator for a recovery period. We can then evaluate several endpoints, including cytopan analysis to evaluate inflammation, transepithelial electrical resistance to evaluate barrier integrity, MTT and LDH to evaluate tissue viability, and histology to evaluate any potential morphological changes to the tissues following the exposure. Custom endpoints and custom study designs are always available. Great. So I hope that video was helpful for everyone. I know for me personally, if I've never used a system before, it's a little difficult to understand how it works. So thanks to Rob for that wonderful demonstration. So using the vitro cell system that was demonstrated in that video, Matt Tech researchers actually worked with the British American Tobacco Research Group very closely to develop an in vitro cytotoxicity model for aerosol exposures. Specifically, this model was focusing on e-cigarette aerosols. Unlike with cigarettes, during the development of this protocol, there was no ISO method that existed for the testing of e-cigarettes. So Matt Tech and BAT did a lot of optimization um, of the exposure method. The decision was made during this optimization to select a high puff vol volume and a frequency, which allowed for consistent smoking duration and aligned with puff profiles for e-cigarettes. In fact, the results demonstrated that a six hour puffing regimen resulted in little variation between experiments and a consistent amount of deposited mass. And that's shown in figures A and B. So consistent puff numbers between the two different e-cigarettes, as well as consistent deposited mass when this experiment was repeated multiple times. This initial study allowed research to, researchers to determine the number of puffs for each e-cigarette that could be used and resulted in a final experimental design equating to 80 puffs. The final puffing regimen actually resulted in 3.5 more mass, 3.45 times more mass that was deposited on the tissue with e-cigarettes compared to the reference cigarettes, which is shown in C. And that's actually going to be important when we talk about the toxicity. So after optimizing the protocol that I showed in the last slide, epi airway tissue was then exposed to both e-cigarettes and reference cigarettes. And interestingly, the e-cigarettes resulted in the greater deposited mass that I just showed, but they did not actually result in decreased viability relative to the incubator control tissues. However, there was a decline in the tier values over the exposure period shown here in B, which the researchers argued could indicate that the vacuum flow may have been at the upper limit for exposure since the air control also dropped in this six hour exposure. As expected, the reference cigarettes in C caused a noticeable decrease in both viability and tear values over the six hour exposure. And in D, you can see cigarette smoke versus the e-cigarettes um, and the viability difference. And so the greater deposited mass actually didn't change that. And so this, help, this study actually helped confirm that epi airway can be used to test the toxicity potential of e-cigarettes at the air liquid interface using both MTT 
end here as possible endpoints. In addition to the epi airway model that can be used for inhalation studies, MATTECH also offers an alveolar model for studying effects of the alveolar region instead of the tracheobronchial region. This model can be used with the vitro cell system and can be dosed apically or basolaterally directly depending on the researcher's goals. The epialveolar model consists of primary epithelial cells, fibroblasts, and pulmonary endothelial cells that are all co-cultured together. The model remains stable for about 30 days in culture and can be purchased with or without macrophages depending on the goals. One example of how epialveolar has been used in the field was for the assessment of pulmonary fibrosis. Fibrosis is a type of permanent pulmonary toxicity that is progressive and does not have any cures. Pulmonary fibrosis results in the development of scar tissue in the alveoli and decreases the elasticity of the lungs that results in breathing issues. So in this experiment, epialveolar was exposed to 10 nanograms per mil of TGF beta for 21 days. And then the tissue morphology and tear and cytokines were analyzed to determine fibrotic changes. After 21 days, the h and &E images, which are shown on the left, show the matrix becoming increasingly dense by seven days, shown here. And by 21 days, they exhibit significant contraction and matrix deposition, which is suggestive of a profibrotic phenotype. Additionally, the barrier function was reduced after 12 and 21 days, which is shown in this graph here. And then in the far right graph, both collagen 1A and fibronectin were increased when measured via ELISA following exposure to the 10 nanogram per mil TGF beta. Epialveolar has also been used to assess these fibrotic changes using the vitrocell system, exposing with TGF beta in an aerosol manner with very similar results. I don't have those results in today's webinar, but if you're interested in that study, we'd be happy to provide the literature for you. Additionally, researchers have exposed epialveolar to nanoparticles and measured changes in fibrotic responses as well. So in this study, researchers worked closely with MATTECH scientists to develop a protocol for using the vitro cell cloud system to expose epialveolar to nanoparticles. The cloud system allows for exposure to liquid aerosols, unlike the vitro cell VC1 system that I showed that's used for cigarette smoke. For this study, the researchers selected Mitsui 7 and Nanocyte multi-well carbon nanotubes, both of which have been shown to cause profibrotic mediated release and upregulated transcriptional and histological markers of fibrosis in vitro. To mimic in vivo responses, a long-term long exposure at low doses was used and a final concentration correlating with either in vivo studies or a lifetime human exposure was selected. Epialveolar was then exposed to the multi-wall carbon nanotubes with or without the presence of monocyte-derived macrophages, which is noted in these graphs as plus or minus MDMs for three weeks. Following the exposure, ELISAs were run to analyze IL-1 beta, TNF-alpha, and IL-6 and IL-8. I'm only showing IL-1 beta and TNF-alpha in today's webinar, but again, we can provide this data if you're interested. Interestingly, the nanoseal resulted in a less pronounced inflammatory response compared to the Mitsui 7, as you can see in the top two graphs, um, which the researchers indicated correlated with past published results. When MDMs were added in the bottom two graphs to the culture, the pro-inflammatory response occurred at later time points. The researchers said that this potentially indicated that the MDMs may help reduce particle exposure through clearance and either release of the multi carbon nanotubes or mediators that activate epithelial cells later in the exposure period. Re results from this study, as well as the past study that I showed, demonstrate the utility for this model in both inhalation and direct application toxicity studies. Furthermore, the ability to induce a profibrotic phenotype provides researchers with a unique model to test compound efficacy to treat pulmonary fibrosis. So in addition 
To our pulmonary models and skin models being used in toxicity studies, our epi-intestinal model is consistently used as well. To discuss this model, I will hand it over to Larissa. Thanks, Katie. And as mentioned, our epi-intestinal model is heavily utilized in GI toxicology testing. And given that the similarities in SIP function between the model and the human intestine, um, this provides a useful model to study drug metabolism and delivery, as well as GI infections. The model forms villus structures and includes functional tough cells, goblet cells, and panis cells. The stem cells present allow for the model to continuously self-renew and have long-term culturing and viability for up to six weeks. The dramatically rising cost of drug development and the high failure rates in clinical trials can be attributed to poor correlation of animal studies to human toxicity. As with many endpoints, rodent models poorly predict drugs that will cause GI toxicity, and when combined with non-rodent models, 30% of GI toxicity is still missed in animal trials. However, the predictive accuracy increases to nearly 80%, which matches the translational accuracy for in vivo studies in higher order species. Matt Peters at AstraZeneca, in association with Matt Tech, tested four AZD compounds that failed in one month talk studies in both rats and dogs. These animal studies underpredicted the clinical diarrhea observed for these compounds, and only AZD 3409 being detected at the max tolerated dose in dogs and AZD 8931 detected at the dose limiting toxicity at, in rats. The researchers then used the epi-intestinal model to test these drugs and found that the model would accurately predict the incidences of clinical diarrhea uh, much better than animal models. This work highlights the importance of developing an in vitro assay for routine preclinical screening. So in addition to the previous four compounds tested, Peter's group also used the epi-intestinal model for the detection of compounds that induce gastrointestinal toxicity and specifically diarrhea in humans. Researchers exposed epi-intestinal to 31 widely prescribed drugs to either induce or not induce instances of diarrhea. The tissues were tested at four concentrations under blinded conditions and the TIR and MTT values were obtained after a 48 or 96 hour exposure and a prediction outcome score was determined. However, that data is not being shown here today. Their work demonstrates that epi-intestinal has a high sensitivity or the ability to correctly detect positive results, specificity, uh, which is the ability to correctly detect negative results, and accuracy to predict compounds that induce GI toxicity. Uh, interestingly, the epi-intestinal model also outperformed CACO2 model cultures for predicting drug-induced GI toxicity. In addition to testing commonly prescribed drugs, another four AZD drugs were tested to obtain kinetics data solely by measuring the tier values. This allowed them to obtain five data features. The inner day consistency was demonstrated by consistent tier readings throughout the experiment. After a three-day exposure to the drug, the apical side was rinsed and the drug washout was monitored for barrier improvement, showing that the tissues were actually compatible with drug washout. The viability was monitored for 42 days, showing no significant decrease in tear values for the vehicle control. The tissues were also compatible with repeat dosing as seen on the graph here on days three and 21. And in addition to repeat dosing, they were also able to measure the different response onset and recovery seen with the treatment of AZD-1 and AZD-8931, both of which impacted the barrier function of these tissues and were slower to recover after the second treatment. This work demonstrates the relationship between in vitro assay potential for preclinical testing 
of gastrointestinal induced toxicity. In today's webinar, we've discussed only a fraction of the models offered by MATTEC and possible endpoints. As mentioned, other commonly tested endpoints for toxicity are histology and measuring protein or gene expression with ELISA's or qPCR. If the cells are needed for downstream applications, we highly recommend viability assessment by measuring LDH release into the basal lateral media to determine the amount of cell damage. These methods, in addition to those covered in today's webinar, provide researchers with both destructive and non-destructive endpoints for their toxicology assessments. MATTEC can provide researchers with the protocols and troubleshooting requirements needed to ensure successful experiments for both those discussed and not highlighted today. As discussed, MATTEC's models have been utilized in the toxicology field, ranging from regulatory assays to non-regulated toxicology assessments. In addition to researchers using these models internally, MATTEC also offers in-house contract services where we work closely with our customers to build unique assays to suit their research needs. These studies presented today are examples of partnership between multiple organizations and MATTEC to build these custom assays. And not only do we work extensively with our customers, but we also work alongside many of our CRO partners to bring you human relevant, efficacious, cost-effective, and ethical testing solutions. Today, we demonstrated a small set of MATTEX 3D models, which included the epiderm, epi airway, epi alveolar, and epi intestinal models for toxicity determination. As we've discussed, these models have a high relevance for in vivo correlation and can be used across numerous different applications and endpoints. And in addition to these models and applications discussed today, MATTEC also offers 15 tissue models from all areas of the body, which can be used for cosmetic, chemical, and pharmaceutical testing. We thank you for your interest in our webinar today and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Katie and Larissa. We're gonna move into our Q&A session and we have so many great questions submitted and we're gonna try and get to all of them. Uh, joining us for Q&A is Jonathan Oldak, our Director of Business Development. Um, he's someone with lots of hands-on experience using our technology in the lab. Um, and we are gonna get started with a question for Larissa. Um, what is the lead time between ordering and delivery for the tissues? So the typical lead time for um, between ordering is and receiving them is about two to four weeks, um, but this is completely dependent on the tissue type. Um, and as mentioned before, our tissues are shipped out um, every Monday um, and you'll usually receive them by Tuesday um, for domestic um, uh, shipments. Thank you. Uh, this next one is probably a good one for Katie. Um, someone asked, do I need special skills or equipment to use the tissues? Um, great question. No, you don't need special skills beyond the ability to culture cells. Um, as for equipment, this really will vary depending on the endpoints of interest. So for instance, for tear measurements, you'll need an instrument for this um, to measure MTT. A plate reader is necessary to measure absorbance. But for a lot of um, different endpoints, you might be able to do it without these things. Um, additionally, MATTEC has a histology course, so we're able to provide histology services also if needed, and that's a, a big thing that people do with these 3D tissues. Another question, probably a good one for John, um, are the donor tissues from healthy or diseased donors and what type of characterization is performed? Oh, 
Sorry, John, I don't think we can hear you. Larissa, can you hear me? I can hear you, Margo. I just can't hear John. Huh. I can't hear you for some reason. I can't hear you. Hey, for some reason, it sounds like we're having trouble hearing John, even though he's right next to me in the office. Um, so we can move on to another question and return to that one and just kind of figure out what's going on. Uh, another question um, regards the tissue storage. Um, someone asked, how can the tissues be stored and for how long? Um, so this once again varies with the model. Uh, we recommend for some models that storage is no more than 24 to 48 hours, while others can be stored um, in the fridge at four degrees Celsius for up to six days. Um, however, this is probably best discussed, uh, the storage needs that you'll need with your um, specialist when ordering. Okay, another question. Um, are MATEC tissue models that are validated for specific uh, assays able to be used for specialized testing at other CROs? Yes. yes. Hi guys, sorry, we we're having some technical uh, with sound, but yes, um, not only are they um, validated, uh, they're commercially available. You know, we work very close with our CROs and helping them set up assays and develop things that work for their customers as well. So yes, you can certainly get the tissues and work with CROs or at your own facility, and we'd be more than happy to help you out. Okay, the next question. Um, we discussed MTT and tier values in the presentation. Um, what other kinds of endpoints can be looked at? Yep, good, good question. So we typically see the use of histology and immunohistochemistry staining to look at these tissues. You can use LDH lactate, lactate dehydrogenase for viability. It's a non-destructive endpoint, so that's sometimes used by researchers. Uh, Western blot, qPCR for protein and gene expression are commonly used, and then ELISAs, which we talked a bit about today for peptides or protein assessment as well. Thanks, Katie. Um, another question that would be good for John probably. Um, can I use MATEC models for it with cell lines? Yes, um, actually I'd say about four or five years ago, we started developing a do-it-yourself kit. So you can certainly uh, purchase our inserts and media and use either primary cells or your own cell lines to create these models. Um, and again, we're very happy to help you with any technical questions that you have. You know, just let us know and we'll set it up for you. Okay, another question, um, probably a good one for Larissa. Can I test final formulations? Yeah, so what's great about our model is not only can you test final formulations, uh, but you can also test meat compounds. Okay, the next question. Um, is the platform compatible with high content imaging? Yes, uh, one of the advantages of our model is that you can get it on different membranes that would allow you to do uh, li either live imaging or you can fix these tissues 
and do cross sections. And once you have the cross sections, like any samples that you have, you can certainly take them and do high imaging on a confocal uh, microscope. Okay, next question. Uh, how long can the models be maintained and used? So this really varies. Um, it depends on what model you're interested in. Each model that we have has a different culture span. These range from about three days to three months. Again, talking to a specialist about this is always really vital. And we can help you decide which model works for you and, and if it'll suit your experimental needs. Okay, next up is, um, what is the difference between Epiderm and Epiderm FT? Yes, so the difference between Epiderm and Epiderm full thickness is that our full thickness model is the same Epiderm cells that are put on a dermal layer containing fibroblasts. So instead of just having uh, about an 85 micron thick tissue, you have about that same 85 micron thick uh, epithelial layer on top of about a 900 microliter uh, mic micromiller uh, dermal layer and that allows you to look at you know crosstalk between your keratinocytes and fibroblasts um, where we will look at anti-aging hydration and assays like that okay, another question um, can you add immune cells to the tissue Yeah, so we currently offer the epi alveolar model um, with and without uh, THP1 derived macrophages. And the epi oral and our epi vaginal models um, can also include or um, not include Langerhan cells. So we do have a couple models with immune cells present in them. Thanks, Larissa. Uh, next question is, what is your experience with vitrocell? Do you always get consistent results? Hi. Yes. Um, the system that we've used is for is the cloud-based system or, or the in vitro cell. So I would say for all smoking experiments, uh, we use them and we do get very consistent cells. We probably do about N of three typically for these studies with different puff counts and get week-to-week -week consistent toxicity and histology data. Okay, next question. Are these protocols accepted by the FDA? Great question. Uh, so the OECD methods we talked to, to talked about today are European based for acceptance. Um, so acceptance of these by the FDA is more of a case by case basis. We work with customers to help find which assays can be used or accepted by the FDA, but again, case by case. So we've had success with our products being used in the preclinical test very consistently. And we're happy to provide protocols and work with you to get FDA approval, but we highly recommend you work with the FDA before moving forward since this does vary depending on the what you're trying to test. Okay. Uh, next question: Are the models from cell lines, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, or primary cultures? Yeah, great question. Um, so all of our models are made from primary human cells, um, other than the THP1 derived macrophages, which comes from a cell line. But yeah, all of our all of our tissue models are made from primary human cells. Thanks, Larissa. Uh, next question is probably a good one for John. Um, do you provide QC data or CFAs with every batch of the tissues that you provide and ship? Yes, Marco, that's a good question. For every kit that goes out the door, we provide a QC report, and that QC report will come with a CFA.
Um, next question is for eye irritation, is there any advantage or disadvantage using the 3D tissues compared with other in vitro assays like BCOP or chicken eye? Um, I would say one of the huge advantages is you've got species to species with um, the human model. These are primary human cells. Um, but yes, when you're looking at the uh, human eye, there's still multiple ways to go looking at toxicity. Um, it, it really depends. It's kind of a circle. It's not just usually just one answer. But I, you know, I would say that starting off with an eye irritation test is usually a good way to go. Okay, another good one, probably for John. Um, do you have atopic dermatitis models? Hi, Margo. Yes, um, we do have the epiderm full thickness model that you are you can treat uh, with a certain cytokine cocktail to turn it into an AD model. And uh, a bunch of pharmaceutical companies have been doing that recently, so that is available and uh, to purchase. Okay, next, uh, does Matek have any wound healing 3D models for toxicology studies? We do make an epiderm full thickness model again that allows you to do uh, wound healing. Um, you can look at it multiple ways, um, either through cross sections and look at histologies and look at the epithelial cells grow across the wound, or you can do it in a whole mount uh, system as well and using confocal. Uh, both are very similar on what you're looking at. The endpoint is the growth of the epithelial cells across. Um, you can look at the tissue model uh, through the histology and see um, how the, the toxicity might occur preventing the wounding, but it's not a simple MTT assay like skin irritation. Okay, another question. Um, that's probably good for Katie on the airway in vitro cell. Um, are the epi airway tissues compatible with other exposure machines? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So the epi airway tissues are comp compatible with multiple systems. Our standard model is grown on Mattec nine millimeter inserts, but it's also produced on commercially available transwells ranging from the 4.26 millimeter to the 24 millimeter, giving some variation and flexibility in which systems this can be used with. Okay, another question. Um, for Epiderm FT, or really for any of our, our models, um, does Matec use the same donor for every order? Yes, so uh, that's a great question. Um, for each particular donor, we have a um, separate donor. Sorry, that's really wordy there. But basically, for each tissue model that we have, Epiderm has its own donor that we have. Um, cryopreserve the cells and we can use them for years at a time. So we do not pool donors at Matech, um, it's single donors and each donor has their its own um, isolation that goes with it and as you go forward. We do offer something like on the epiderm full thickness matching donors if you're looking for the keratinocytes and fibroblasts, but um, overall each uh, donor, each system is its own donor as you move forward. Thanks, John. Uh, another question, um, is there an irritation testing protocol available for the epivaginal model? Um, we are in the work in process of working with the FDA. Um, we do have a protocol that we use for it where you are going to look at uh, some similar endpoints that you would look with um, epiderm, meaning MTT. So we'll look at uh, three time points and we'll We'll view the viability through MTT at the end. We also look at uh, H&Es and TIER, and uh, I would say we've been working with that for the last couple of years, and it's moving forward and hope to see um, a validated assay in the next you know, couple, of, I'd say six months to a year. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, if models are created from primary cells, is there batch-to-batch -batch variation? Yes, I'd say that's one of the uh, huge advantages of MatTech is that um, it's from primary cells that we've isolated and then cryopreserved. So 
not only from batch to batch are you looking at the same uh, results and reproducibility, but you're looking for it at years at a time. Okay, here's another good question. Are any MATEC models regarded as non-animal or vegan? Hey, Margo, yeah, that's a great question. It's something that we're actually working on. Um, we have started the process and we're very close to it with the skin model. Um, and we're also working with it on our lung tissue. So this is something that we are definitely um, been putting a lot of hard R&D into, and we hope to have something out in the next, again, six months. Okay, and another question, another good question. These are all really great questions, by the way. Um, for epiderm or you know, for any of our tissues, um, can it be created with the same donor which for fibroblasts and keratinocytes? Yes, this is uh, kind of similar to a question we asked before, but yes, the, you know, again, if you're talking about epiderm, um, it only has keratinocytes, but if you were talking about epiderm full thickness where you have a keratinocytes and fibroblasts that can be created from the same donor. Uh, we have about five to 10 different adult donors that you can use for that process. Okay, we're running out of time. So we're gonna have a couple answers. We have a couple questions that um, we're not going to get to, but we'd be happy to, to answer those off the webinar. Um, so thank you to Katie, John, and Larissa. Um, that's gonna conclude our webinar today. And as a reminder, all uh, attendees will receive a link to view the webinar recording, as well as a companion packet with access to the references we shared during the presentation. And you can also feel free to reach out to us with any additional questions, and we're always glad to answer. So thank you so much to our presenters for a great presentation, and thank you to all of our attendees for sharing your time with us today.